Thank you so much, Neil, and thank you for that warm welcome. I just love coming here to North Berwick. You know, um, quite often I, I get the privilege of speaking in churches across Scotland, which is great, but, but quite often there are special places you find. And uh, um, I don't want to be over-spiritual, over-superstitious, but the, the Celtic Christians called them thin places. And, you know, I think North Berwick's one of those thin places. I think it's one of those places where heaven touches earth and it's not just a beautiful scenery. And I hadn't intended to say this, but I actually think it's one of those places that God is being contested at the moment in the heavenly realms. And it's one of those places that I think God is going to do something significant in little North Berwick that maybe will affect the whole of this nation. And that's just like God, isn't it? When Jesus came he came to a little town in Galilee in the back of beyond, not the big metropolis of Jerusalem or any other cities in the, in the Roman Empire at that time. So I ju- and this may just be what I had for breakfast this morning, but I just sense that God's wanting to do something significant and actually you as a fellowship are part of that. And you look around you and you think, come on Keith, don't be daft. There's not many of us here. But I tell you, you are going to grow. And you're going to impact not just this community, but this nation. Amen. Let's um, turn to the passage that I'm going to speak on if I can get this. <laughs> um, and it's uh, in, in John 10, verses 6 to 18. And I'm... Those who heard Jesus use this illustration, it's Jesus just using the illustration about the sheep and that, that. So those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. So he explained it to them. I tell you the truth. I am the gate and all who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to come to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them rich and satisfying life. In fact, the, 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 the better translation is to give them life abundant, life to the full, life in all its richness. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for his sheep. A hired hand will run away when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. So the wolf attacks them and scatters the flocks. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. Just as my father knows me and I know the father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep, too, that are not of this fold, but I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. The father loves me because I sacrifice my life so that I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have authority to lay it down when I want and also to take it up again. This is what my Father has commanded. And Lord, I just pray that your word will come alive to each of us this morning, not just in our minds, but in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. There have been um, two items in the news this week that have really caught my attention. And uh, the first one was a statement by the Arsenal manager, Boo Hiss, I'm a Tottenham supporter, the Arsenal manager, uh, Mikhail Arteta, who made this a prophetic announcement. No one knows when Jesus will return. It's true. Of course he was speaking of Gabriel Jesus, his injured uh, striker, but I couldn't miss the opportunity. <laughs> there was the headline of my newspaper, no one knows when Jesus will return. Amen, that's true. Uh, the other one um, was um, 
the sheep that was lost was found. Yeah, did you see that? And apparently he'd been lost for two years. And, and uh, at the bottom of the cliff or something, and all the, all the farmers came. Uh, and again, I, I, I couldn't miss that opportunity to, to, to share that, that one with you. And I, and I wonder this morning, if there's anyone here that's feeling just a wee bit lost. It's very easy, isn't it, to have an exterior where things are going on and everything's fine. I, I was just sharing with Bill before the service that life in, in my family is not all rosy at the moment. We've got a few difficulties that we're facing. And, but we're not unique in that. I think that could be replicated in every family that's represented here. And sometimes life has this habit, doesn't it, of, of creeping in on us and catching us unawares and us thinking like we're on stage without lines. We don't know what we're doing. We don't know where we're going, what's happening. We don't have answers for the situation we're in. Now, perhaps you're not in that situation. But I know many people are. I, I'm a, a son of a farmer. Um, my dad was a farmer. We didn't have sheep. We were a dairy, we had dairy, a dairy herd, a hundred head of dairy cattle, and we had some, some beef cattle, and we brought on calves, and we did some arable farming, but we didn't have sheep. And when questioned about this, my dad said, well, sheep are stupid animals. And you speak to any shepherd or farmer, and they, they will tell you that, that, that in fact, one, one of my, uh, uh, my brother's neighbors a farmer, and he keeps sheep, and he says, sheep are born to die. If there's a way, an innovative way that they can find of killing themselves, they will. You know, they, they provide them with pastures of perfectly good grass. But what do these stupid animals do? They try and get across the wall, break through the head, to eat on the side of a busy road where the grass isn't that good anyway. So sheep are really silly animals, which is a bit embarrassing because the Bible continually uses the analogy of people being like sheep. In Isaiah 43, uh, 53 verse 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way. So that's not really a very complimentary thing to say. John Stott, the great um, conservative uh, Anglican preacher who uh, died a few years back, wrote this. I'm remembering it because having just retired from pastoring a church, I, I gave away a lot of my books. And this quote was in the book that I gave away, so I'm, I'm, I'm quoting it from memory, so it might be wrong, so Google it and find out. John Stott wrote this. The universal extent of sin is not something known by revelation alone. It's the truth of our everyday lives a fact that cannot be denied, to be denied. A promise is not enough. We need to have contracts which are signed and witnessed. Doors are not enough. They have to be locked and bolted. The payment of fares is not enough. We need to be issued with tickets which are then inspected, stamped and collected. All these things and many more to which we've become so accustomed to that we take them for granted are a result of human sin. We cannot trust ourselves. We need protection from one another. And of course he was referring to the verse in Romans 3 verse 23 where it says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us in one way or another has sinned and has fallen short. Every single one of us has wandered away. Even the Apostle Paul wrote this into one, to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1 verse 15. He said, I am the chief of sinners. And then we read in, in, in Romans 7, Paul says, oh, the good things I want to do, I don't do. But the bad things I, 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 I don't want to do, I do do. Oh, wretched man that I am. And yet this amazing man was responsible for writing, I think, two-thirds of the New Testament. An incredible gift of God. An incredible apostle. The apostle that brought the gospel to the Rome and, and to the Gentiles. And yet he counted himself as a chief of sinners. How could that be possible? 
we'll explore that in a moment. Because not only if we've got the truth on the one hand of the universal extent of sin of humankind, we have the truth on the other hand of what we've been singing about this morning, of God's grace, of God's mercy, of God's heart and desire for his sheep, that he would lay down his life for his sheep because he loves them and they're precious to him. But let's explore this, this good shepherd theme a little bit further. In, what, in John 10 verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I emphasize the I am because any Jewish hearer at that time would clearly take offense at that. Because if you look at Exodus 37, I am is the name that God gave for himself to Moses. So Jesus in saying, I am the good shepherd was first of all claiming, clearly claiming to be God. And in John 10 verse 38, he says, the father is in me and I am the father. In John 14 verse nine, he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the father. Make no mistake about it. Jesus is God. Colossians 2 verse 19, Paul wrote, the fullness of deity dwelt in him in bodily form. In Christ, the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. You see, we've had a kind of theology somewhere in our churches, somewhere where we've seen God as being God, clearly. And Jesus has been a little bit less God. And the Holy Spirit, if we believed in him at all, is some sort of ethereal presence that floats, that floats around. But actually, as Christians, we believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one. All three are God. Make no mistake about this. The Holy Spirit is God. Jesus is God. God the Father is God. That's the Christian doctrine. That's the offense to, and the uniqueness of Christianity, actually, and it's the offense to, to, to many others. So, so Jesus clearly, make no mistake about it, as a Christian, we have to accept the deity of Christ, that Christ is God. But the second thing, it says, I am the good shepherd. And the Greek word here for good is kalos. And it means much more than moral perfection. The whole word, in the, the whole word here, it, 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 it's wrapped up. It means goodness. It also suggests beauty. Goodness is beauty. And we're attributing beauty to Jesus when we talk about him being good, he is not just morally good, he is beautiful, he is wonderful. Uh, and, and it suggests a beauty and an attractiveness. So when Jesus says that I am the good shepherd, that is what he is. And that is who he is. He is just God who is good. Never trust any theology that makes God appear anything less than good or beautiful. Never trust any theology that makes God appear anything less than good or beautiful. My friend and colleague uh, Wes White, who who's also uh, serves with us on the core team of the, of the Scottish Network Churches, Wes, Wes is a bit of a, an academic. He's got two PhDs. <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, but you would never know that. He, he, he's just a church planter. And he's one of these academics that actually is really practical. So one of the things they do, I love the fact that we shared communion. One of the things they do is that they have the upper room church where they have people from asylum seekers, mostly from Muslim majority backgrounds, that come. And they invite, they invite everybody to come and share communion. So you've got Muslims coming and sharing communion. Now that can't, oh, hey, hey, come on, that's a bit... Uh, but do you know, in the process of taking that communion, they meet Jesus. And there are so many testimonies of people finding healing and wholeness just through, through the act of taking communion. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. But Wes has got this phrase called the gospel that beautifies. The gospel beautifies. And he uses an illustration of where he got, when, he, when he was in, in, in Western Africa and uh, in, I think it was a democratic Republic of Congo, I might, might have that wrong, but they, they took the, their master's students to, to this, this, this church in a very poor community. Now the community, the, the, the sewers were open sewers running down the center of the street. The place stank. It was, they, they lived in sheds. It was a very poor community. The church began to grow. 
And what the church did was they diverted all the sewage from, from, from the drains and that in, in, into, into veg patches. And they produce fruit and vegetables to feed people. So they're producing fruit and vegetables and flowers. And, and suddenly, this whole people will come for miles around to look at this community that was once derelict and, and, and now is beautiful, full of flowers and full of food. And, and the community is flourishing. And the pastor of the church says, yes, the gospel beautifies. And you know, that's my heart for you in, in North Berwick, that, that North Berwick, with all its problems, and it looks beautiful on the outside, but you know it's got problems, don't you? But I believe that this church will allow North Berwick to be beautiful. Because the gospel beautifies and it's attractive and it's lovely. So Jesus clearly shows us. Oh, so one other thing, one other thought before I, I move on to that. I've recently come back from a holiday in, in, in the Lake District and we were walking around Dirtwater, for those of you that know the Lake District, and I, I was struck because we saw this shepherd on his quad bike with not one but three sheepdogs with whistles and he was herding these sheep up from this vast paddock that was with the, the you, know, you know the dry stone dikes around it and he was herding these sheep up and and the sheep dogs and he got the, all the sheep in one corner of the field because in, in 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 ancient israel the shepherds went before the sheep and the sheep knew their voice you knew that didn't you yeah i mean every, every bible teacher tells you that so everybody knew that Whereas in this country, we drive the sheep and, and we have sheepdogs and, and herd them. Well, they herded the sheep up. But the thing that really struck us all, my, my, my friends and I, as we stood and watched, watched it, was once he'd got the sheep pinned in the corner in, in one part of the paddock, he actually walked round, and it was a big field. He walked round the whole field, looking in ditches, looking behind butchers, bushes to make sure that not one of the sheep was lost. I thought, what a beautiful picture of care and grace and that is the picture we have of Jesus when he talks about being the good shepherd he's a shepherd that cares because Jesus clearly shows that by laying down his life for his sheep he is doing something that his sheep cannot do for themselves he's breaking the power of sin and death and the sheep now find freedom protection and security but it's so much more than that. John 10 says, says, for I've come that they might have life and life abundantly in all its fullness. Jesus is the way to find salvation. And, and I think as Rob said this morning, the only way. But it's not just about eternal life. It's about fruitful, flourishing life in the here and now. Abundant, free and purposeful life in the here and now. That is is what becoming a disciple of Jesus offers you. Fruitfulness. And it's such a relevant message for today. Do you know that? Today when there is so much insecurity, so much uncertainty, as the things that we've relied upon have become very unreliable. My pension pot's taken a real dive. Do you know that? There's war. In Israel, in Ukraine, the pound doesn't seem to be recovering. We, we, we seem to be in, in, in a, not quite a depression, but we, we seem to be in something. The Bank of England seems going to go, go on for 2025 before we see any recovery. There's fear. And here in this passage, we read that Jesus is the answer. You see, culture does not have the answers for the questions that people are asking now. But Jesus does. And Jesus, in this passage, promises guidance or leading, protection, leading into good pastures, as, uh, as Neil read uh, from Psalm 23. What a brilliant way to start the service this morning. Thank you, Neil, so much for that. That he's prepared a table for you. God like a good shepherd has gone ahead of you and prepared something for you. I, I shared a story recently. Um, when I became a Christian, I, I, I was in the Royal Navy at the time. I don't come from a Christian family. And um, I, my, my, I was on HMS Art Royal, which was then the largest ship we'd had, the largest ship the Navy ever had until the recent Art, Art, 
uh, aircraft carriers were built, and it was an aircraft carrier, and uh, with 2,600 men on, on on board this ship, and it was 58,000 tons. You could, if you ran round the flight deck four times, you ran a mile. Um, it, it was big, and it, from the, the flight deck down to to the the keel was 11 decks, and into the superstructure where the conning tower was and the, and, and, and and Flyco was, uh, and and the bridge was was, was another nine nine decks. So it was like a 20-story, quarter of a mile long block of flats at sea. It was a big ship. <clears throat> and there were about 30 Christians in the Christian fellowship on board that ship. And I was one of them, and I don't become a Christian not long. And, and I was in a, in a mess deck, which was quite a, a small, probably the, the size of your, some of your lounges, with 33 other men in that. And being a Christian in that environment was not easy. In fact, a friend of mine was reading his Bible one night when somebody came back from a, a, a run ashore, which has been to the pub, basically, and, and urinated all over him in his bunk because he thought it was funny to do that. I got bullied for being a Christian. And I was 17, no, 18, 18 years old. And I hated every minute of it. In fact... There was nowhere you could hide. From the time you got up to the time you went to bed, you were surrounded by people who thought it was funny to play tricks on you, to steal things, to make your life a misery. And I remember crying out to God. And one night, as I was sat in my bed, and I'm not ashamed to say I was weeping, I read this verse in Genesis 41:52. It's about Ephraim. God, the, the name given to Ephraim means God has made me fruitful in the land of my grief. God has made me fruitful in the land of my grief. And that scripture became living to me. This Bible that we're reading came alive and spoke into my life. And I haven't got time to tell you all the stories but the guy that urinated over my, 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 my Christian friend, a year later had the privilege of leading him to, to the Lord and he became a Christian. As a result of, of, of that time, seven other people in that mess deck became, a Christian, became Christians and found faith in Jesus. I actually began to flourish and actually became accepted and began to, 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 to take part. And, and life changed for me dramatically, all in answer to that prayer because the good shepherd heard my cry. So if I've got time, one other story. Uh, there, there was a, 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 I might have told you this one before because it's an incredible story. This, this guy called Vic Tunstall, he was about five foot six. He was built, as the polite word was like a big brick outhouse. And he was a big, big bulky lad, but only five foot six, as strong as an ox. Had a beard, potted face, was an ugly character because he'd broken nose, he'd been in fights, he'd played rugby, he'd done, you know, was not a pleasant character actually. And I ended up going, in, when we were in Virginia, take it, going to a hotel break with him for overnight. And I ended up leading him to God. And he became a Christian. Amazing story. This guy, and, and the amazing thing was that he, he didn't just burst out in tongues. Now, he'd never been to church in his life. Didn't even know what tongues were. And I had to, to explain to him what tongues were, and it was about the Holy Spirit. And it was just amazing to see the transformation of this guy, this ugly guy, suddenly... Well, he still wasn't that good looking, but he, there's, there's something different about his countenance. He, he, he came alive. But the amazing thing was that 2,000 miles away, my wife had never met Vic. And Vic had never met my wife, and I'd never met Vic's wife. And at the same time, my wife was leading his wife to the Lord. Hey, isn't that cool? <laughs> now, don't tell me that prayer doesn't work. And I wanted to share that story because this was the context of my workplace. This wasn't Sunday church. This was work. And the good shepherd's with you in your place of work, in your home, in your community, in your town. That's as much a calling and anointing as any preacher has. In fact, I was often more effective when I had a proper job than when I became a full-time Christian. You know, Because we're all full, we're all aren't we? All of us. 
I hate the term full-time ministry because all of us as Christians are called to full-time ministry. You, yours just might be in, a, in an accountant's office or, 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 or wherever you happen to work or, or, or a labourer. It makes no difference. God, the good shepherd, hears you. you. He hears your voice when you speak to him. And I cried out to God and he heard my voice and he answered me. Most li- God sometimes speaks to me in dreams, but, but most often he speaks to me through scripture. And I think we've got to recover the reading of scripture. I think we've got to get people reading their Bibles more. Can I have an amen or am I just getting grumpy old man? Verse 14, my sheep know my voice. I know my sheep. And in verse 3 it says, by name. You are not just an anybody. You are a somebody. A somebody that God knows by name. You are somebody that counts. What you do matters to God. Jesus cares about you what do we read about the the 99 that were found and the one that was lost what did the shepherd do went off to find the one that was lost and I want to come back a bit of a revert back to where I started there's a lostness when you don't know Jesus and I wonder if there's somebody here this morning that is experiencing that lostness Well, you can find him. You can know him this morning. But there is also a lostness for those of us that have been walking with Jesus for many years, isn't there? There's a time when life just comes over and takes over and we get, as I said earlier, a wee bitty lost. And I would just encourage you this morning, if that's you, just cry out to Jesus. He knows you by name, cares about you deeply and loves you. And he wants you to flourish as a husband, as a wife, as a daughter, as a son, as an accountant, as a teacher, as a labourer. Whatever label you may have, God wants you to flourish. You see, in salvation is not a matter of achieving, but believing. Salvation is not something that just happens once when you pray that magic prayer. It's a matter of daily responding to the call of Jesus. What did he most often say to his disciples? Follow me. And I think that's a challenge that we all face. That every day Jesus says, will you follow me today? I have things for you to do. Places for you to be. People for you to touch. Will you follow me? I've got a life in you that I want to flourish. I want to beautify. You know, that that same walk around the lake... I was walking with the first couple I, who I ever conducted a wedding for and, uh, it, uh, and they've remained friends ever since. And the other couple that we were with were, 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 a, were the couple that we planted our first congregation with and we've remained friends all over these years. And we stayed up at the, one of these pop-up coffee shops around, around, around the lake and, and the woman at the coffee shop said to, to us, there's something different about you guys. And she was a bit new agey, I think. She said, there's a lovely aura And in that moment, we said, yeah, well, we're actually Christians. We know Jesus. Now, I don't know whether that had any impact at all or whether that would make any difference. But in that moment, we had an opportunity just to speak about the difference that Christ makes to all our lives. The trouble is, when we look at ourselves, we only see the rubbish. When we look at ourselves, we only see the things that we do wrong. We only think that we're not good enough. But that's not how God sees you. When God sees you, he sees you as something beautiful and precious. And what's more than this? 
And I can guarantee that it's true because as I'm looking over this congregation now, I see it in your faces. The gospel does beautify. You carry something of the presence of Jesus with you. Now I know like Paul, you'll have your struggles. And there are good things that you want to do that you don't do and there are bad things that you don't want to do that you do do. But that is the amazing thing about the gospel, isn't it? We don't deserve it. It's grace. And it's love. And it's why Jesus died. He died because we couldn't do it ourselves. And he is a good shepherd. And he says to you this morning, will you follow me? Will you follow me? For some of you, that's remembering your first love. For others, it's something this morning you're saying, right, this is one of those moments. I'm going to step in to the table that's already prepared for me. Because when Jesus says, follow me, it means he's gone before you. He's gone ahead of you. There is nothing that you will face that he hasn't faced first. Let's pray. I love this verse. 1 Peter 5 verse 7 says, Cast all your cares on me, all your anxieties. Why? Because I care for you. And Father, I thank you for the truth of that scripture. And I pray this morning that we will hear your voice, we will follow you, and we will give you our cares because you care. Holy Spirit, will you touch our lives afresh this morning? Will you spark that spark? that we've had when we first knew you. Will you rekindle it, I pray, in Jesus' name. And just before the band play, I want to just allow a moment of quiet for you to say yes to Jesus. To say yes. I'm going to keep following you. Not just today, but tomorrow. Not just in church, but at work in my home and in my community. I'm going to keep following you. And I'm going to keep listening to you and hearing your voice because I know you hear my voice. Just take a few moments and let God speak to you. Neil and the band are going to play now but I, I would just encourage you if you'd like prayer this morning about anything that I've mentioned or even if I haven't mentioned it you just feel you need prayer this morning and help in your journey of following Jesus I'm sure there'll be somebody here to pray with you and to pray for you bless you, thank you